So I was inspired by my buddy Jim Sweeney, uh, who read one of his beautiful stories the other day and just set up his video camera. Um, I think, you know, probably a lot of people are, you know, doing this kind of media sharing. But, uh, so anyway, I thought that I would, um, add something of my own. Um, I feel, you know, this is, uh, an opportunity we're in right now with the coronavirus and, you know, everybody trying to take it seriously and do their part. And, um, I am like really, really blessed in my life to have a partner that I get to be socially isolated with. And I have a family that I get to be in touch with on a regular basis. And I went and stole my friend's dog. Uh, so we even have a dog to keep us uh, company. But I realize that this is a fortunate position that we're in. And I don't think that everybody has that uh, same kind of um, kind of structure in their life. And um, so I want to try to, you know, in whatever way possible, um, be there for other people. And I think storytelling is one of the most important ways we as a species have been able to um, get through tough times and this story has nothing to do with what's going on it's just one of the stories that I most uh, recently uh, wrote and so without further ado I will read this story it's titled Cycling Towards Culture. On the north side of the Alaska Range I skidded and bounced down the Delzell Gorge struggling to keep my expedition loaded fat tire bike upright Mounds of frozen dirt and icy roots flung me sideways, and I squeezed both brake levers, trying to stay on two wheels and not wrap myself around a tree. Suddenly the decline steepened. I spotted a glimpse of bare ice ahead and let off the brakes to avoid skidding out. Finally the trail leveled out into a meadow blanketed in crusty snow. The frosty branches on the black spruce trees glistened in the morning light. I lowered my bike and yanked out my camera. A dog team was behind me, coming fast. I wanted a photo. Through the forest above me, I could hear the dog driver gently encouraging his team to slow down. Whoa, easy, easy, good girl. I flipped on my camera and knelt down, finger on the shutter. After thousands of years of being Alaska's most unfailing means of winter transportation, lifeless internal combustion motors have almost entirely replaced dog teams. Sport and competition have become the stopgaps for widespread utility. The Iditarod, Yukon Quest, and many other mid-distance and sprint races throughout the state have helped keep mushing and our lifeline to history alive. My sled is trashed, the Iditarod musher said as he and his 14 dogs blew past me in the meadow. The conditions in the gorge had been ideal on my studded tire fat bike, but frozen dirt, rocks, and patches of off-slope black ice had been hell for the dog driver. Following their progress through my camera's viewfinder, I could see chunks of UHMW plastic and shattered fiberglass that had rattled loose and unbroken and broken. Unfazed, the team of stunning huskies maintained their steady clip down the trail toward Rome. A couple hours later, I pedaled into the remote Iditarod checkpoint, which consists of little more than a solitary well-built log cabin adjacent to a gravel landing strip. Only a few of the Iditarod's fastest mushers had made it this far, and each of them was ready for a rest. I found Jasper, the race marshal, and asked him if he needed a volunteer. Absolutely. You can set up your camp on the airstrip. We need folks to lead teams into the yard, and there are camp chores aplenty. Not long after the first Iditarod race to Nome in 1973, Joe Reddington Sr. began encouraging other user groups to utilize the trail too, including, eventually, winter bicyclists. For decades, a subculture of hardy souls traveled from near and far to participate in the Iditarod bike and later I did a sport, human-powered races on the Iditarod Trail. These events were the catalysts that helped spur innovation that finally led to the modern fat bike. My captivation with mushing came at age five. Seasonally, my family made the drive to Anchorage from her home in the Wrangell Mountains to refill depleted provisions with store-bought goods. On, the mem on one memorable trip, my father took the family to watch the film Spirit of the Wind about sprint mushing legend George Atla. A year later, at Winter Carnival in Toke, I stood starstruck in my oversized beaver parka when my father pointed and said, That's the real George Atla. I had my first hero. Watching a team of well-trained dogs respond to nuanced and subtle commands of a compassionate and dedicated driver is profoundly emotive. It's easy as a spectator to get a glimpse of these hard-won animal and human connections at the start or the end of a dog-mushing event. 
only the most calloused onlooker would not be moved by witnessing the frenzy of pre-race excitement as it becomes channeled into the starting shoot. When everything goes right, one can observe the genesis of magnificent unison as a team of 15 become one mind, pursuing one objective. Nothing in my experience, however, beats seeing a dog team in the wilds of Alaska, far away from the noise and bustle of the crowd. A fat bike is the perfect instrument to bring you there. Over the years, I have gleaned evident lessons from the trail. There are three that rise to the top. As a non-musher, regardless of your discipline or sport, always yield to dog teams. A snow machiner, skier, or cyclist has a much easier time pulling off to the side and an easier time getting going again. Always leave a shelter cabin along the trail in as good a condition, or even better, than when you found it, as these shelters can save lives. The last one is subtle, but is perhaps the most important, because it, if it is observed, everything else will follow. Never shake a fellow trail user's hand with gloves on. Even in minus 30, it's imperative to shake hands along the trail with bare skin and honest human contact. The warmth that this simple and long-standing traditional gesture offers is greater than any momentary discomfort. I awoke before dawn after the previous long day and even longer night at the checkpoint in Rhone. Noticing that the cabin's water supply was running low, I grabbed the orange plastic sled with two screw-top five-gallon buckets and drug them half a mile away to the chopped hole in the frozen Kuskokwim River. Throughout the previous 18 hours, I had helped dozens of mushers lead their teams to their straw beds and had shaken hands and conversed with many giants of the sport. The race marshal and veterinarians never slept. The tired dogs and trail-worn drivers curled into little balls and took their well-earned respite. All was, quiet in the, all was quiet as I admired my surroundings in the still, crisp air on the north side of the Alaska Range. The faint glow of pre-dawn light silhouetted the proud mountains to the east. In my moment of quiet reflection, a lone husky from the dog yard let loose a stirring howl. Instinct abandoned took hold of me, and I responded in kind. I hope you all have a lovely day. Thank you for listening.